Amen. Good morning. And I am excited about part three of the Listen to the Voice of God series. And so on last week, we really talked about his active word, his living word, and how we understand his living word and the thoughts of God and how he would have us to have his thoughts, the mind of Christ. And so a major component of this is to understand that indeed, 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 uh, we uh, are to have the thoughts of God. And that's how he interacts with us when we are able to have the mind of Christ and seek him in spirit and in truth. So today we are going to focus on uh, the book of Matthew. And we're going to go to chapter 6 um, in the book of Matthew. And so after we go through the background of this and after we understand so many different aspects of God and how he speaks, to put it all into practice and application and have a conversation with God on a regular basis. It's what we intend to do um, and intend to teach. Amen. So, going here, Matthew 6, and we're going to uh, go down to uh, verse 9, and it is going to be uh, the beginning of the main portion of what we'll talk about today. And I'll read the, the first part of this, the first eight verses, just quickly. And it says, this is to the believer. This is to the one who uh, is a follower of Christ. And it says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so one of the things that I've talked about in this series is the importance of sharing what you learn in a series. We are to be careful about our motivation in sharing. We want to teach others how to draw closer to God and have conversations with them and get answers for the prayers that they pray and the direction that they seek. But be careful not to be haughty, not to become arrogant, not to think oneself more highly than you ought because you're able to tap into God because you have learned how to seek him in spirit and in truth and receive answers from him. And so clearly, Christ knows us. <laughs> he knows how easy it is for us to become proud of what we've done what we're able to, to do, what we're able to tap into. And so as he prepares to teach us how to pray, understanding that the prayer template that he provides us elevates us, positions us to enter in to the secret place. He forewarns us to be careful, to be mindful. And so it really sets this up to be a very important um, foundational lesson that he is giving us in the template of the Lord's Prayer. And so in verse 
5 it says and when you pray do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others truly i tell you they have received the reward in full and even i can tell you that oftentimes it feels so good to say oh i get up early in the morning and seek god i spend five hours in prayer before the lord <laughs> We really have to check ourselves and our motives. Because if we really want to draw closer to him, and we want to be able to hear him clearly with clarity, then we have to remain humble before him. The position that we take is a position of humbleness. When you go before the Lord in any other position, with it being tainted, then it convolutes your conversation with God. It makes it harder to bind distractions. Does God speak in an audible voice? Yes. But if that's your goal, to hear his audible voice to be able to say that you heard God's voice, you're missing it. You're missing the purpose behind being able to have a conversation with him. If you're wrapped up and tied up in how God is speaking to you and wanting him to speak to you in a particular way, then you're missing it. I'm not speaking about asking God for uh, a confirmation. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, we had someone ask a question on Friday, on last Friday. How do you know that it's God that's speaking? And one thing you can always do is ask for a scripture for confirmation. The enemy is not going to speak to you in truth. The enemy speaks to you in part wants to twist the truth so one thing that the enemy is not going to do is direct you to your word to read it in full <laughs> so receiving a scripture receiving a verse a passage of scripture that comes from the Lord and so here in verse 6 it says but when you pray Go into your room, close the door, and, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And so we want to get into a practice of drawing closer to Him, building a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Him. So then when we are before the people, and we are asked to pray, we go before the Lord. And we're able to hear more clearly what God has to say. Verse 7 says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. And this doesn't mean that you cannot pray long prayers. But it does mean not to go on repeating yourself over and over again in order to extend your prayer's length, in order to seem more in tune. What we are learning here is not about the length of time it takes for us to get the answer. What we are learning here is about the discipline it takes to position ourselves before the Lord in the way that he has given us. So verse 8 says, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So when we come before the Lord seeking a conversation with him, we are to come before him in the manner in which he has provided and so now we get to the meat and potatoes of this thing 
my very favorite part. And it says in verse 9, this then is how you pray. So I want you to examine this verse, this first portion of verse 9. And it says, this then is how you pray. Now this is the NIV version. I'm going to go to the New King James version quickly and read the first part of verse 9. And it says, in this manner, therefore, pray. In this manner, therefore, pray. And I'm going to pull a couple different, a few different translations here of that beginning of verse 9. And the New Living Translation says, pray like this. Pray like this. I want to make sure that we have a very clear understanding of this first part of verse 9. When I go to the Amplified Version, it says, pray then in this way. But I love the um, NLT in that portion, but it breaks it all the way down. And it says, pray like this. And so going back to the NIV, because we'll study this version from um, the NIV, you're welcome to study it from King James. In fact, for those who um, love the King James Version, uh, we'll take a look at that as well. And for the King James Version, the beginning of verse 9, it says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. And it simply means, pray like this. Many of us from a young age was taught the Lord's Prayer, that he prayed. And there's so much power in praying the Lord's Prayer, being able to memorize it, meditate on it. It's a very powerful prayer. But I want us to understand that there's more to this prayer than praying it verbatim. There's more to it than praying it word for word. Praying this prayer also has an understanding of what each portion of this prayer is teaching us. It's important that we understand the meaning behind it much like the Old Testament and the things that the Israelites were given to do. It wasn't just for them to do them, but it was for them to understand why it needed to be done. Because as we cross over into the New Testament canon, there were several who were confused, like the Pharisees, because they were stuck on just doing a thing and not understanding the value behind what they've done. Taking it for only face value to not understand that you can dig a little deeper, understand it a little bit better. And so while, yes, it is important for us to learn the Lord's Prayer, be able to uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, he wants us to understand that it is a template. It is a teaching tool. A guide for us to know how to enter in, how to position ourselves to have a conversation with him. After all, prayer is communication with God. And so, the first part of this says, Our Father. And we'll just stop right there. In the interaction of learning how to have a conversation with God, we will use this very prayer as a template to guide our prayers into the Lord. And as I've taught this to several people, 
um, that God has allowed me to come in contact with prior to this class, I've, I've learned um, how different um, people um, understand this passage, how they connect with this passage. And I've come to the understanding and the knowledge that there are denominations that pray this prayer religiously. Um, and when I say religiously, I don't mean that in a negative term. It is just that there are denominations that this is a part of um, a daily, uh, a habitual piece of their daily life to pray this prayer. And so if that is the case for you and you connect to this prayer um, in a way that um, each word, every single time you pray it, it is alive in you as it should be. I want you to understand that this is not to take away from the power of the prayer itself. This process that we are learning does not take away from the intensity and the perfection of the prayer itself. We are not making the prayer better. We are not trying to improve on the Lord's Prayer. We are simply diving deeper and drawing closer to the Lord by doing it just as he stated, understanding that this is a template into teaching us how we are to pray. To pray like this. So in the very first part where it says, Our Father, This is really very important because it connects to Romans 10 and 9. Romans 10 and 9 is the prayer of salvation. And it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you have to know who you're talking to. This is your salutation. This is your declaration that God is your God. This is you proclaiming and addressing him formally, just as you walk up to uh, a parent and say mom or dad, just as you walk up to a teacher and say miss or Mr. So-and-so, just as you address your best friend when you see them across the way, hey, bestie, whatever the case may be, you are first positioning yourself by announcing who you're talking to. Who you are addressing and so this becomes a very important part as an introduction to our prayer because there are many different aspects of who God is he is vast and he carries many names and so there are times that I approach him according to what I need from him in that conversation just like a husband and a wife will sometimes call each other by their first name. Sometimes they'll call each other by a nickname. Sometimes they'll just um, address each other by something playful. Whatever the case may be, depending on what is going on in that moment, it's how they address them. A parent will call their child differently according to what is going on in the situation. My children know that if I call them by their whole name, they better get to me quickly. There's a call to attention in the way that I call them. And so there are times that I start my prayer off with Father God, because I'm addressing him as my Abba, as my father. I need my daddy. There are times that I approach him and I say, Almighty God, because I'm in need of his power. If I approach him, as husband, I am approaching him as head of my household. I'm needing guidance and instruction on decision making. I'm wanting to know which direction he wants me to go regarding the house, the kids, our family. So get used to 
learning God in different ways and being able to call him by name according to how the conversation is to go. And after this, you have our Father in heaven. This is a place of honor, a place of respect, a place of understanding that he is higher in his way of thinking than us, that his ways are beyond our ways. This is a scripture that we've gone over in one of our previous lessons, that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways beyond ours. When we say in heaven, it is positioning him above whatever situation we're in, whatever problem we're facing, whatever is going on currently in our world, it is acknowledging that he is higher. This is a place of reverence and respect. And so in our prayer, we can say, Abba, Father, most high God, higher than any problem that I can face, God of heaven. Ooh. <laughs> the template that Christ has given us is for us because it empowers us. The template that he has provided, he has taught it in such a way that it sparks confidence when we are having a conversation with the Lord. That it blocks out the enemy's plan because it elevates us to a level of being able to seek him in spirit and in truth. And so when we say, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be your name, it is a position of praise. Praising and honoring him, giving him his kudos. Praising him. So I love this because when you're praising God, you're focused on the goodness of the Lord. When you're praising him, you're not focused on the pain. You're not focused on um, the, the thing that would make you depressed or anxious. When you're giving him praise, you can't help but to feel a certain way when you are acknowledging you're a good, good father. You are amazing in all your ways. Lord, you are triumphant in all that you do. You are a truthful God, an honorable God, holy God, a sovereign God. You are the I am that I am, the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega. You are the lifter of my head. You can't help but feel a certain way when you give God praise. When you bless his name, so hallowed be thy name is blessing the name of God, blessing who he is, giving him his due props. That's hallowed be thy name. And so you move forward to uh, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Understand that right now in heaven, angels are rejoicing. They are singing praises unto his name, even right now. So understand that your praise is connected to bringing heaven to earth in your situation. Praise is important because it is a, a required portion of positioning yourself before the Lord. That's why the psalm says that a praise shall continuously be on your mouth when it says praise him in season and out of season. When it says enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. In order to have a conversation with the Lord, in order to seek him in spirit, you must enter in, into the inner courts. 
and praise gets you into the inner courts. That's why Paul says, in order for me to be content, I've learned to be content in all things, whether I have plenty or whether I have lack. He said, I've learned to be content. It is by way of him thinking on good things. On whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is a good report, whatsoever is pure, whatever has virtue in it, thinking on these things teaches Paul to be content. And so coming out of depression, coming out of anxiety, coming out of worry, position ourselves in a place of confidence in who God is and what he can do requires praise. In fact, when you go to the psalm and it talks about enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise, it behooves you, it helps you to sing Songs of praise. Before going into prayer, those times that is difficult for me to get in a pace of being able to hear him and drown out the noise, singing praises unto the Lord. Praising him either in uttering words of praise or singing psalms to him helps me to get out of my own head, out of my own thoughts, out of my own way to be able to receive from God. Bringing heaven to earth requires praise. This is also another acknowledgement that it's about God's will and not our own. This is also a place of humbling ourselves. So when we pray to acknowledge that our motives have to be pure. I heard it said in Kingdom First Network in the glory room just on yesterday by uh, one of the brothers, Brother Nathan. He was talking about his favorite scripture in Matthew where it says to seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what that meant to him was every time that you are doing something to do it to the glory of God, to seek how it can please the Lord. And so here, when we see your kingdom come, your will be done. It is denying ourselves of what our flesh wants, of what our thoughts say, and voicing that we have the understanding that it's God's will that is more important, that it's his way that matters, his thoughts that we want to take on. When you look at Christ praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to the cross, he says, not my will, but time be done. Not my will. And so if you want to receive the thoughts of God, if you want to hear the voice of God, if you want to know what God is saying, you have to bind your thoughts. You have to bind your way of thinking. The scripture says, lean not to thine own understanding. But in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will. There's one of those equations. He will direct your path. The Old Testament teaches us that a way that seemeth right to a man is foolishness. It brings about destruction. So we cannot lean to our own thinking. We have to acknowledge who God is and acknowledge that it is what he wants that is important. So we deny ourselves, deny our flesh, deny what our thoughts are, cast those aside to take on the thoughts of God. So that whatever God has said in heaven, we agree with here on earth, bringing heaven to earth, being kingdom-minded, understanding that the way that we progress in our life, the way we overcome, the way that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us is to do it his way. That's why it says it's through Christ Jesus. He loves us. Being more than conquerors is through him, his way. 
So you can't come to God with preconceived notions. You can't come to God with your mind made up of how you're going to do a thing and think that you're going to hear him clearly on how he wants to instruct you to do it. You have to empty all of that out. You can't come to God asking him, God, do it like this. Putting him in a box. You have to empty all of that out. You have to rebuke all of that. And open your heart and mind to receive what thus says the Lord. The kingdom way of doing it. And I tell you, oftentimes the kingdom way of doing it is nowhere close. <laughs> nowhere close to the way that we want to do it. <laughs> it's nowhere close. Oftentimes. Because his ways are beyond our ways. And so verse 11 says, Give us today our daily bread. We need daily nourishment from God. Jesus is the bread of life and he is the word. John says in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. And so Jesus is the word, the living word of God. What we see here on this earth and even ourselves was created through him. When God spoke, <laughs> it was created through Christ. So when he spoke, Jesus activated. So the daily bread that we seek is the word. And there is a word for us every single day. In fact, there's a word for every situation. I believe it's Corinthians. I have to dig deeper. Um, I believe it's Corinthians that teaches us that all scripture is good for reproof, for instruction, for guidance. All scripture. So no matter what we face in life, there is a verse Somewhere between Genesis and Revelation, there is a passage of scripture. There is an understanding somewhere between Genesis and Revelation that we can apply to our situation. No matter how much technology comes about, no matter how advanced man gets, no matter how advanced God allows man to get, there is nothing beyond the reach of a scripture. No matter how many languages you learn, no matter how many degrees are behind you that you've been able to obtain, there is nothing in your life that takes place that a scripture cannot answer, for it is the bread of life. It is your daily nourishment. And so people say, well, how are we supposed to know how to date? They didn't date in the Bible. <laughs> they didn't go out for candlelight dinners and, and to the movies and, 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 and be about different people throughout the course of their life and then choose one to marry. And I say to you that again, no matter what situation is in your life, there is a passage of scripture to answer, to give you direction, to give you confirmation, to give you guidance, to give you correction, to teach you, to advise you, it is there. And sometimes the advisement that we get is that something should not be done. Sometimes the advisement that we get is how to do it within the confines of today. And so you have to seek him for your truth but you cannot come to him demanding that he teach you in a certain way that he do things a certain way what are our thoughts that we think that we can instruct the instructor we cannot and so not only do you have a daily bread you have a situational bread and we are to ask the Lord for a verse, a scripture, a passage, a chapter, a book 
a word from God to apply to our situation, to our day, to our life. We should be asking for a scripture every day. You have these applications that have a daily scripture because there is something that you should be meditating on daily that you receive from the Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. And so when you have a conversation, watch this. It is a two-way thing. A conversation is not just one person talking. Conversation is feedback from the other person. Questions may be asked from both sides. Questions may be answered from both sides. There's something to be said. So when you see here where Christ says, give us today our daily bread, we are asking for feedback from God. This is a two-way communication. Prayer is not one-sided. We've heard that said, but here is the proof in the pudding that Christ himself said, give us this day our daily bread. In our prayer life, we are to wait for an answer from God. We are to listen for his voice. We are to listen for his instructions. We are to listen for what he has to say. It is a two-way conversation. It is meant to be communication. It is not just us giving him praises. It is not just us going to him asking for what we need. It is not just us going in repentance and saying what we've done and confession. There is also a part where God speaks. And too often we say, amen, get up from our knees and walk away without hearing what God has said. It is a two-way conversation. And so for your situation, learn how to ask for a scripture. And that is something that we're going to do in the interactive portion of this is ask for scriptures because the scriptures are alive and active. And they are in response to our life. They are in preparation of what we are to do. They are the instructions that we are given. And it says, and forgive us our debts. So here again, we refer back um, to the lessons that we learned when we were studying uh, the old um, Testament passage, uh, and, and what I'm sorry, what we um, were studying in Hosea, the importance of living a repentive life, the importance of walking in forgiveness. There are things that while I'm praying and I'm opening my mind to repentance, that God reminds me of things that, of things I didn't even know I needed to repent for things that I didn't even really understand that I needed to repent for. Sometimes we are repenting for things that are uh, generational, that happened before we were even born. Sometimes we are repenting for things that we did when we were 10 years old. So when we are doing this interactive piece and we are praying, it is for us to open ourselves to receive whatever God has for us in those thoughts. And so as you are praying, God is still speaking. And so when you are saying, forgive us of our debts, you are to uh, explore that. What are my debts? Because remember, there's a confession. Confess your faults. There is a confession in repentance. So as I'm praying, communicating, as I'm communicating with God in my prayer, I'm saying, Lord, please forgive me of, and I'm allowing God to fill in the blank, remembering that his thoughts are higher than ours. So whatever thought comes to my mind in that moment when I open my mouth and I yield to the Holy Spirit to show me and reveal to me what I need to repent for. One of the things that we'll, we'll talk about is speaking in your prayer language, speaking in an unknown tongue. And in order for you to speak in an unknown tongue, in order for you to speak in your prayer language, you must yield your mouth to the Holy Spirit. You must make your mouth available to the Holy Spirit in order for the Holy Spirit to intercede on your behalf. You must give up control of your mouth. 
making your mouth available oftentimes just means opening your mouth and saying, Holy Spirit, speak through me. Likewise, in being able to pray a prayer of repentance, you have buried and been in denial about some of the stuff that you need to lay before the Lord. So in this two-way communication, you open your mouth and allow the thoughts of God to guide your tongue in what you are to repent for. In your prayer, you can even say, Lord, show me what I need to repent for, what I need to repent of. Holy Spirit, speak through me and what I need to repent of. And just you making your mouth available unto God helps you to be able to know how to repent. And so from there, from there, it says, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness is a two-part process. Anytime, anytime, every time we ask for forgiveness, we should also be forgiving someone else. Remember, verse 9 of this passage says, pray like this. Don't get so busy asking for forgiveness of all the things that we have done and forget to let go of what's been done to us. Remember the parable in the Bible where there was a man who owed the king. The king let him go forgave his debt, that same man went and found a, a brother in the community who owed him and he uh, treated him beyond unfairly because he didn't have what he owed him. The king found out about it and was disgusted and he paid for it dearly. Forgiveness is a two-part process. We repent but we also forgive others. And here's another opportunity to allow the thoughts of God to fill in your blank of your prayer. And it is a declaration. This portion is a declaration of letting someone go. Forgiveness frees your heart to receive from God. Letting go of bitterness and anger frees you to hear from the Lord. Oftentimes we hear a good word, but it falls on stony ground because we are harboring anger and bitterness and malice. And we're wondering why we can't get an answer from the Lord. And we're wondering why it can't be clear because we are harboring anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. And so allow God to fill in the blank. And whatever comes to mind, whatever thought comes to you, and yes, God will dig up some people from your past that you need to let go. Then you make a declaration, I forgive so-and-so for what they did. I forgive, sometimes you'll have to forgive yourself. I forgive myself. And so as we carry on, it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is a prayer of protection of your thoughts. Don't even let me be tempted to think my own way. Don't even let me be tempted to go back and pick up anger. Don't even let me be tempted to go back and pick up bitterness. Don't even let me be tempted to be distracted by my environment or distracted by my uh, sorrows or my problems or my situation. Don't even let me be tempted to have the wrong motive in this moment. Don't even let me be tempted This is a prayer of protection. And so here you can bind stubbornness. You can bind hard-headedness. You can bind distractions. You can bind depression. You can bind worry and anxiety and loose the opposite. I can bind fear right here 
and loose trust in God. I can bind anxiety and loose freedom and liberty in God. I can bind my thoughts and loose the thoughts of God. I can bind anger and loose joy. And so you want to protect your conversation with the Lord here. And you want to acknowledge the thoughts of God because that's what will block your thoughts. Binding your thoughts, accepting God's thoughts, acknowledging Holy Spirit. We've talked about that within this prayer. And so you want to acknowledge Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And verse 14 says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Um, and another uh, version um, of this, it says, um, for the glory. For the glory. This is all unto God. The motivation that we are to have is to be pleasing in his sight. And so as we go into interactive portion of this on Friday, really think about how to structure your prayers in this way, because this places you in position to hear the thoughts of God. And you can trust the thoughts that you receive because you've positioned yourself because of the equation that says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge God and he will direct your path. He will direct your path. He will direct your path. The New King James Version completes the prayer as, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And this portion is important because this is your acknowledgement. That this is about you, God. This is about your kingdom. This is by your power. This is by your Holy Spirit. This is to glorify you. So Lord, please provide me with a scripture of what you want me to understand, what you want me to know. Here you can ask God a question. God, what do you want me to do today? And the very next thoughts you receive are the thoughts of God because you've positioned yourself to hear from him. Here you can say, Lord, should I take this job? And you can receive the thoughts of God on whether or not you should take the job. This opens up communication because now you've positioned yourself and you're seeking him in spirit. Now you're in the spiritual realm because you've done it God's way. You've made sure that you've done it God's way because you followed his template. You didn't leave anything out. So you can be assured that what you receive from him is of God. So after you've bound your thoughts, after you've bound anything from the enemy, you are acknowledging God. You are acknowledging the presence of the Holy Spirit and asking for direction and then trusting. Watch this. The word of God says that he who wants wisdom, let him ask for it. Believing. God is going to give you wisdom when you ask for it. You have to trust the answer that he gives you. So these conversations that we're going to have with the Lord are not in vain. You don't ask God which direction to go and then go on your own. You don't ask God, what shall I do in this situation? You hear the first portion that feels good to your, to your, to your flesh and you're like, oh, I like that one. And you run off without getting the rest. This is a full 
conversation with God. And so when we come back on Friday, we will put these things into practice. We're going to talk about Friday, some things to safeguard yourself on, some things to be aware of. We're going to talk about things like don't try to finish God's sentence. When you feel that your thoughts are trying to urge them, bump themselves in, you can tell when you're trying to finish God's sentence, when you're trying to figure out what he wants to do and you're trying to start to plan it out for yourself and you've taken control back, you start again, you rebuke your thoughts. Nope, God, this is not about me, not about what I want. I rebuke my thoughts. I receive yours. I acknowledge you, Holy Spirit, lead and guide my path. Show me, Holy Spirit, what God wants to say. Um, for those who may be hearing this recording, one thing that I end this class with um, is opening the doors to the church, as they say, or an invitation to accept Christ in your life. Um, because to communicate with him, you must first accept who he is. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that none, none come to the Father but by him. And so to be able to hear the voice of God, you must have a relationship with his son, with his only begotten son. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, for whosoever believing in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so this body, this flesh will pass away, but our soul, our spirit, our soul can be saved from the wages of sin, which is death, eternal death. And so Jesus paid the, the price of that. Romans 10 and 9 says, If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou will be saved. And so you can repeat after me this prayer that says that I want Jesus to be my savior. I want to accept him. I want to be able to have communication with God. He is a very present help. He is not, salvation is not just for us to go to heaven, but salvation is for us right here on this earth. He wants to interact with us. He wants to talk with us and guide us and lead us. And so you can repeat after me now. Dear God, I know mankind needs a savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again to save me. Right now, I confess my faults, that I've been lost, and that I need you as a savior. I want you as my Lord. And I confess that I am forgiven because you redeemed me. And it says in Jesus' name, that I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I'm saved. That's it. And now you walk it out. Ask the Lord to guide you, show you, lead you to a Bible teaching church, body believers, where you can be baptized. To show the world that you have accepted Christ into your life. That's an active way that you can show and declare that you have accepted Christ in your life and that you are changed from the inside. Go and be baptized. Your salvation has taken place today just by you accepting him. Now go show it. And then get connected so that you can continue to grow in him and learn of him. And Father God, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We glorify your holy and your righteous name because you alone are worthy to be praised. We pray that this word has fallen on good soil today and that people are able to take heed of what you have said, to apply it to their life, to live it out, and that we are more intentional about having conversations with you throughout our day. It's in Jesus' most precious and holy name we do pray. Amen, amen, and amen.